So we start uh, now with the first speaker, uh, Franco Pestilli, who is uh, currently Associate Professor in Psychological and Brain Sciences at Indiana University Bloomington. And uh, he will start in August 2020 as, as, associate, as Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, his uh, research focuses uh, on uh, vision and cognition neuroinformatics with emphasis on brain behavioral changes across lifespan and due to disease. Uh, he's a founder and director of uh, BrainLife.io and uh, contributes to several international projects uh, to promote uh, data sharing and open science. The title of his talk is Advancing Scientific Discovery via, uh, via Cloud-Based Collaboration and Open uh, Neuroscience Methods. Franco, it's on you. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, Good we morning. do. All right, so I'll talk today about Brain Life. It's a project that we started uh, three years ago by now, and the goal was to uh, create an online platform, a free platform for everyone to use that would allow um, uh, training and research in neuroimaging and neuroscience. Okay. The goal of the platform and the project was to target three key uh, communities of researchers, uh, people that are good at writing code and would like their code to be used and would like their analysis to be shared, and people that are good at collecting data uh, oftentimes, these two expertise don't go well together. Uh, people that have access to clinical data or might be interested in different types of processes such as development, aging, or cognition. At the same time, we wanted to connect these two communities with a community that is not often thought of as being part of the uh, neuroimaging ecosystem. Uh, these are folks that manage clusters, that uh, that develop a new technology for processing of data, large amounts of data. And these could be people that sit at CERN. We see the nice talks yesterday about CERN or people that are sitting in even in different institution. The goal of the platform is to bring together, to work as a glue and create mechanism on incentivization so that um, you find ease of use of some of the code and then ease of use of the data and resharing on the data and then uh, easy access to computing facilities through the cloud. So the, the, I will show you through the platform uh, how it works, but as a brief summary, uh, data are organized within projects. Projects are private. Uh, you define a project, you create a project and you keep access to the project and you decide who can access the project. Uh, within a project, the data are stored and organized into data types. At the same time, uh, there's access to a library of apps. Uh, apps are small pieces within a large ecosystem or uh, pipeline for processing of data. Uh, we think about apps slightly different than other projects. They are small, they are um, modular, they are composable, and, and the platform helps you and the user to select which app goes with which. I'll show you a little bit uh, about that later. Uh, you can process data individually, which I believe is what I managed to show you today, but you can also do bulk processing. Uh, in a couple of cases, we have processed about 10,000 projects, uh, individual data sets on the platform within a matter of a couple of weeks uh, because we exploit multiple resources uh, across, um, at this point, the USA. Uh, we provide data visualization. We provide different types of data visualization. Some uh, we develop within the platform and other are mainstream like FSLI or Free Surfer View, et cetera, that uh, can be accessed uh, from within the platform so that you can look at uh, your data. The idea of the visualization from Brain Life is not to change the data through an interface, but to look at quality control and make sure that you're processing as happen and happen correctly. Uh, if you work on the platform, meaning if you manage the data on the platform, uh, the platform provides a complete data provenance. We keep track of all everything that happens on the platform. We keep track of the apps that was run on a data set. We keep track of what data set was generated by this app. We keep track of the app version on GitHub, on the GitHub code all the way to the commit. 
and then we provide all that information back to you in case you want to share it with collaborators or with other or publishers in case you want to uh, show how you process your data. Finally, if you do everything on Brain Life, meaning you import your raw data, you process the data and generate the results, and then once the final features are developed, you can do your statistics and process and do your paper. Uh, you can generate a publication. A Brain Life publication is a, uh, it's a single bundle that contains all the data you analyzed and generated, plus all the apps that were used to analyze and generate the data. So we received funding from NSF, that was our seed funding. Currently, we also are a couple of incoming funding from NIH and we have uh, support from Indiana University. And soon we will have uh, strong support also from U University of Texas at Austin and TAC Supercomputing Center that is number one within the US. This is the team. Uh, there's a, the platform is based on a community of scientists that have been working uh, with us and uh, with the project. Uh, Soichi is the main developer, the lead developer of the platform, but also many of the students and postdoc within the lab, but also outside of the lab have been contributing code and, um, um, and resources such as data or simply expertise. Uh, you can go to the page team and see everything. You, some of you might know Julia, if you're in Trento, Julia just graduated her PhD there at uh, uh, FPK with Paolo Vezan. Okay, so let's see that we log in. I'm going to go to my home directory. Uh, it's bringing me to the project. I'm going to move here. I welcome you to try the platform if you have access to the internet, uh, another window next to you, please. You can log in and create an account. Uh, the, there's different pages that are organized within a menu. Uh, apps, that's where the processing pipelines are organized. We feature the recent, most recent apps here. For example, it's an app that Paolo Vezani's group just created on the platform a couple of days ago. And then we also have apps for alignment. There's different categories. I need to move this window because I don't see. There's category for alignment, anatomical processing, diffusion MRI. We have fMRI pipelines, etc. So let's see one of them for fMRI prep, which we will hear more about today. So you can come on Brain Life and run fMRI prep, and you can use fMRI prep to build, for example, connectivity matrices, um, uh, functional connectivity matrices. Uh, we have two versions of fMRI prep, one that generates output that are volume-based, and another one that generates output that are surface-based. This is how an app looks. Uh, so this is the anatomy of an app. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. I hope you can see. You can execute the app. You can look at the code. That's the second version, the second link on top of the app name. Uh, and here you see the code version that we are currently running for this app. Uh, the app uh, on Brain Life is provided with a DOI. This DOI, Digital Object Identifier, can be used. And papers that have been using the platform have been adding tables to the method sections, adding all the uh, different DOIs that point back to the app that was used for processing. Uh, data on Brain Life are organized into uh, data types. Uh, apps know are smart and know what data type they receive as input and what data type they will generate as output. And you can see here, the fMRI prep generates and receives a lot of data. Um, we also show where this app is running. Currently, this app can run on an IU system, on a TAC system, TAC, Texas Supercomputing Center, and another IU system. There's maintainers and contributors to this app, and uh, these are the people that get credit for it. And this is the readme file from GitHub uh, that points back to how the app should be run, et cetera, et cetera. So apps on Brain Life are just a piece of code, and uh, we have a specification that helps developer develop apps. In this case, Josh Foscovitz in Olaf Sporn's lab at Indiana University developed the app, and then uh, he forked the app into our project. That's not necessary. He preferred to do it that way. Uh, the app on Brain Life are a simple, simple uh, script that runs um, a bash script. And this bash script is um, simply running, most of the case, the times is running a singularity container. 
So here's where we run. We run a singularity container and then a Docker container. And you can see here we're running a version of uh, fMRI prep from the uh, Paul Drack Lab at Stanford University and Oscar, I believe, will present later today. And so very simple to make an app, especially if you have beads uh, apps already developed for your code. In fact, Brain Live apps are compatible to Beads app. Uh, what we do, we take the Beads apps and then um, wrap some code around them and then we run them from within the platform. Data, I'm going to go to the data portal now. Data organized in two projects. Uh, if you log into the project page, you will see that uh, there's multiple projects here. I end up seeing more projects that you probably will see uh, if you log in because I'm working with uh, some of these folks to help troubleshoot things or just simply collaborate. Uh, project can be seen this way or the other way. Project has some statistics. We report how, much, how many data sets are available, who are the users, uh, that have been working on the data sets, and then there's some title and some uh, information. Here, for example, it's a recent data set from a group uh, in, uh, in Magdeburg. Uh, they process uh, the data on brain life, and we are now publishing the data set as a reference data set. In this case, you see what the main page of the data set looks like. There's administrators and members. The administrator decides who gets access to the data or not. Uh, we provide statistics about how many CPU hours the project uh, run and then how many total um, gigabyte or terabyte of data are available. We also report some statistics about how many resource usage this project has provided. This project runs several apps. Each color is a different resources. So Jetstream, it's a public resource for computing in the USA. CARS is an IU system. Bridges is a GPU system that is in Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. So we're running on different machines. We're also running on Microsoft Azure, and we had experience running on Google. You can see here, most of the processing happened in Bridges, in GPU, and then Orange here. But some of the processing also happened on Carbonate. Uh, we asked people to cite you know, the, the folks that put some effort and if you want to see the data, you access the archive, and this is how the data looks like. Data on brain life uh, look like little objects, and objects pro uh, contain information. We can tell you where this object is stored, how big it is, this is about one gigabyte, and then who generated this, pro this object. This was actually pre-processed using an app that runs MRTX3 pre-processed that was developed by Brent McPherson within the lab. Uh, and once you have a data set, you can do multiple things with the data set. First of all, you can look at the provenance graph. This is how this data set was generated. The green are the inputs and the blue is the output and white is the app that actually generated, taking the three inputs, this app generated this data set. You can also visualize the data. And here's what I was mentioning before. You can look at the raw files or you can look at the data using FSLI, FSL view, MR view, MRI cron, and then Fiber Navigator and Freeview. These are the only ones that are available now, but we're adding more viewers. So for example, if we want to do this, uh, we are now taking the data and transferring to a resource that has available cycles and then can um, uh, display the, the data. Uh, it's critical to uh, highlight now that we don't mean this to be uh, made as a I mentioned that before. All you want to see is that the data looks good. This is a diffusion imaging data set and things look pretty well. Now, uh, for the apps, we actually store all the information that was used to use the app, not just the app, but also the app version. So you can come here, you can download the data set, you can download the provenance graph, precisely what I just showed you, or you can download the reproduce shell script. So Brain Live comes with a command line interface. I don't think I will have time um, to um, show you that today, but the command line interface is here, allows you to run the apps locally and pull from the cloud 
um, the, the, the data and the apps completely uh, automatically and you can rerun locally all your processes. So here is an example of this script, very simple in this case script. Um, this is a script that uh, I hope you can see is large enough. <clears throat> it's a script that will take the data from the cloud and then take the, the correct app from the cloud and then run this app with a specific parameter that were actually used um, during the, the, the processing that generated the, the data set that we're looking at here. So it's a full reproducibility. So that part is still uh, beta developing, but so far it's been pretty good at working. Now, let's say you're sitting within a lab. I'm gonna try now to go to a different uh, um, project. Okay, so I actually had selected this project before. This is a project that I've been using for testing and for uh, education. Uh, there's just a few example data sets here. I process data and I move them here. So these are different data sets. For example, there is a um, YMC, it's a truck profile. What that means, it's a, it's a, a series of anatomical st structure that connect different parts of the brain. Uh, I have basic statistics out of this data set that the platform reports automatically for each one of the tracks, for example, the left arcuate, the right uh, middle longitudinal fasciculus, the optic radiation, the IFOF. I know how many fibers I, uh, the process generated for each one of them and some of them has less fibers, some of them are more fibers, but I know what it is. I also know which app generated this one and I know where it's stored. I can look at the complete provenance graph, which in this case is a little bit more complicated. So this data set here was generated from two inputs and running a series of apps that you can see here. And each app is reported here with the original parameters. And you can download some of the metadata that might be associated with the subject and uh, using the sidecar compatible with the BITS uh, data sets that we saw earlier today. You can visualize this data again. And in this case, we develop a visualizer within the project. This we call this a truck profile. We're, again, we're loading the data now. For each one of the anatomical structure, you will see it's been populated. And as soon as the structure show up, uh, they become visible. So in this case, this is the uh, IFOF. Uh, I also had the anterior aslant, which is a good truck. And then the VOF, which we recently, that's coming up the VOF, which we recently published a couple of years ago now, and uh, many, many other, for example, uh, the motor thalamic radiation, the parietal thalamic radiation, et cetera. So you can see here, you can take a look at what an anatomy looks good, or maybe you wanna go back and reprocess the data. Okay, so uh, this is one data set within a project. How do we get that process started? So here, you can either upload the data down here, or, you can take a data set and you can push it to processing. So if you push it to processing, you select which project to push it and you can only push it to project that you have access to and you can create, or you can create a new project, a new process within this project. So what I did now, we move from our child to processes automatically. The data are being copied. And here I have an example of a process data set that uh, has already completed for you guys to look at. So I, what I did here, I ran a free surfer defacing app on a T1 and uh, the app uh, automatically showed some of the results. You have a snapshot of the results. You see that the majority of the face uh, was removed. And I see here, there's a little bit of an issue. Some of the nodes might have been left, et cetera. So once I'm here, this is the processes control panel. You can either create a new project new process or you can uh, automatically process the data again. For example, the data set that I'm currently looking at is this data set here, was a data set developed uh, as an input and generated this T1 anatomy data set that is uh, ACPC aligned and defaced. So if I click submit app, the platform will suggest you the app that are available, a more popular one and more general one that actually can take the T1 as an input and generate some derivatives. In this case, FreeSurfer, it's an obvious example. 
but also we can align on a CPC plane. We can extract the brain. We can check the orientation. We can remove the bias. We can do many things, as many as the apps that have been uh, contributed by the community on the platform. Okay, this is how we ask, app process apps. If you want to create uh, pipelines, uh, Brain Life allows you to create a rule that actually now, this one is an example of the rule that I created some time ago. And this rule uh, will automatically grab out of the archive the, the inputs and the outputs for the, uh, for the app that you select. In this case, we selected to run the Benson Atlas that will map retinotopy on the posterior visual cortex. This is a very exciting work that came out a few years ago that is able to delineate visual cortex only from a T1. And we identify as an output P PRF, and then we give a parcellation, both on the surface and on the volume, which defines each area. So this is now uh, an active rule. And imagine you're uh, working on your project and you can upload data here every day that um, uh, you collect new data. That rule, as long as it's active, will actually look for new data coming into your project and automatically find the resources that can process the data, analyze the data, and then save back the data into your archive. So that as new data comes in, it will be automatically processed and will allow you to process multiple subjects at the same time and pipe in a certain way apps within the platform in such a way that we can track from the platform and you get all the uh, benefits of that tracking. We can track information that tell us precisely how was that app, uh, how was that data set generated? And you can then put that information into your papers if you want. Now, if you do what I just show you, you come and bring data and uh, analyze data, you can generate a publication. A brain life publication is actually a, a slightly new concept. It's a single bundle that connects both the data and uh, the code uh, or better, the services that were used. Several publications have been published as to, uh, today and more papers are under review or in, in different stages along the process. This is actually the original first publication we created. Uh, it's a collaboration with Paolo Avezani. Paolo came to the lab a couple of years ago now and we demonstrated together how to um, actually process the data on brain life and how to save the data um, using a single DOI. So here is the DOI to this data set. You actually get the data. It's populating here now. Okay, this one is the older data set. You can uh, see the data here, each data set that we generated. And you can also, for each data set, you can uh, see which, um, You can visualize the data set. Again, you can go back and look at the app that was used to generate the data set. And this is the original app and you can download all the information. So this single bundle or the single record contains both the data and the apps uh, stored together. This data sets about 2000 data sets, a tractography, 12 subjects from different sources and about two terabytes. So there's different way of uploading data, of importing data on brain life. Uh, the classical way, the most standard way, what I showed you before, you can come into your project and then you can um, go into the archive and you can upload data. You can also use a common line interface to upload data automatically from your, from your computer. And I'll show you a little bit about that if we have time. There's another way to um, import data on brain life. You can go to this page called dataset. This is a recent development on the platform. This is a new grant in collaboration with Michael Hanke and Yulik, and also with Yaroslav Halchenko at Dartmouth. And we develop a, a nifty interface that allows you to search via DataLad. You guys might know a little bit about DataLad by this time. Um, uh, how different data sets that are published in different resources. Many of these data sets, for example, are published by us. Others are published by uh, other consortia, for example, this is Michael, Michael Milham and Cameron Craddock um, uh, NKI dataset. You can import the dataset 
and you can choose which part of the data set to import. You can create a new project that is yours. And then after you hit, you hit the import, that will create the project and actually move the data. There's a lot of data sets here that come from Open Neuro. For example, the neuropsychiatric disorder uh, data set come from Open Neuro and you can import that data set and then process it. I, uh, we have started and we were, we're working hard to actually cover on Brain Life uh, a collaboration with Open Neuro. So if you go to Open Neuro, uh, you will see, uh, this is now Open Neuro, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. This is Open Neuro, I'm opening one data set on Open Neuro. You can see that you can either download the data set or you can analyze it on Brain Life, which means you can push it back from here uh, that link will click you, will bring you here directly, and then you can import the data set. So this is something that we're working hard and we'll be actually updating a lot of the functionality. As soon it will be very easy to take a bits data set into Brain Life, push it into open neuro as raw data, or minimally processed data, generate all the derivatives from Brain Life, and then push back the derivatives on open neuro as many as possible, given what bits cover. Finally, a couple of other examples here. Uh, this is a different visualizer that we organize. So here on this side is our connectivity matrix. And you can see here, in addition to the connectivity matrix, we also uh, showing the connection. So on one side, we have the strength of connection, connecting superior frontal and partial uh, uh, pars uh, opercularis. That um, it's a part of the Auslant, I believe. And then, you can change what type of matrix you're showing. In this case, it's a density matrix. In this case, it's a count matrix. And you can show many different um, connections here in this visualizer. This is another visualizer. We also have visualization for fMRI data. In this case, it's a population receptive field, data mapped into the back of the brain. And you can, again, these are meant to be used for um, quality control and check purposes. You can look at different cortical depth. And here we use free surfer um, surfaces in this case. You can inflate the brain more or less. Let me see, let me inflate it. You can split it a little bit more so that to visual, yeah, okay. So this is one way to look at it. You can display different maps. For example, I was looking at polar angle. We can look also the R square of the model. We can look at um, the area, of, uh, the size of each area. We can look at uh, the eccentricity map from each one of the areas that we have here. Again, I'm back to the projects. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention is that uh, we talk about resources early on. This is where the resources live. Apps are registered on resources. We have actually the open science grid here. We have some resources that are provided by my lab, some resources provided by Indiana University, other resources from TAC Supercomputing Centers, but also we have resources provided for free by NSF. This Jetstream is actually the main cloud that runs most of what we are working on. Uh, but we also have um, resources from uh, Microsoft that are coming up as part of a fellowship that we just received. Resources can be registered. You can come here, and if you're a resource administrator, you can add your own resource. What we need for registering a resource, we need a work fee, we need some in information how we log in into there, we need a host for the input and the output, and then we use public keys and private keys to actually connect the Brain Life platform with the resource. Once a resource is um, uh, registered, we can register on the resource different apps. So apps run on specific resources. So there's a security layer here because we need to grant access to a resource for each app. So you can develop an app, but then the lab test needs to be approved to run to specific resources. In this case, Open Science Grid actually has a free surfer app and then has an app that, that perform tracking and then as an app that perform free surfer. We have two different versions of them. Uh, the GPU apps actually have different apps that use uh, obviously GPU computing. And you can see here the track sag and then some denoising and some other apps that have been developed by collaborators that are all registered on this resource. So the project has a Slack. So if you hit down here, you can actually connect to our Slack channel. 
uh, um, here is the Slack channel. There's a pretty fervent community now that we try to help as much as possible. And there's about, let's see where we are. There's about 1,000 users now currently logged in. And that is one of the best way to get in touch with us and, um, and connect with the community that is using Brain Life. Uh, finally, I want to point out that we are working and we have extensive documentation. So Brain Life Docs uh, actually brings you to this page and this page gets you some idea of what is Brain Life, how it works, how to get started, how, what is a project, pretty much some of the issues I mentioned today uh, are reported here, what is a publication, etc. We also have been developing um, uh, tutorials, actually Bradley Caron has been uh, helping quite a bit with this part as part of a lecture class that we taught at Indiana University semester and that I'm teaching now again in the fall at UT Austin. Uh, we explain here how to create um, a project, how to start, get started with brain life, how to process fMRI data, how to process diffusion imaging data, how to process population receptive field, how to perform tractometry, get estimates of white matter from major tracks, how to build functional connectivity networks and how to build diffusion MRI network, structural network, and then what to do with the networks once they're built. There's also documentation about installation and uh, uploading uh, data sets, running apps locally through the CLI command. Uh, there's information for developers, how you build an app, how you, uh, what is the backbone of an app is described here, how you register the app on the platform. The app has two stages. In one stage, the code is deployed on GitHub and on the second stage, the code is then registered as an app or a service on Brain Life. We provide some information about localization, et cetera. And here there's information about resources, some more technical architecture about the platform and how the platform is uh, organized. And you can uh, go on GitHub, github.com Brain Life. That's where the majority of the code that supports the platform, but also many of the apps are here. So if you type up, uh, the GitHub will show you what the many app code for the many apps. Some of the apps are uh, Python based, some of the apps are shell scripts, some of the apps are uh, MATLAB. We have actually have some licenses to run MATLAB code on the public resources funded by NSF. Okay. I go back to the beginning uh, here. I hope uh, this was informative enough. As a, as a start, I'd be happy to talk to you guys more and about different aspects of the platform and the vision of the project. And I go back thanking all the people that have contributed to this project, as well as some of the collaborators uh, to the project that are now listed here, Lefteros Garifalidis, um, from the DiPi group and then Surge from the DiPi group have been uh, key. And then we've been working with Danny Bassett, uh, Fabrizio Vico Fallani and uh, uh, Rick Betzel to import a lot of function, uh, functionality and analysis stream for network neuroscience. That's exciting work that will be coming over the next um, days uh, and weeks actually. And also we just started a new uh, couple of new projects for studying concussion in collaboration with Nicholas Port at Indiana University and another project working on EEG data analysis stream uh, in collaboration with uh, Sorbonne in Paris and then Ina Pius leading at Indiana University and different uh, uh, folks involved with the ME toolbox. You might know the ME for processing of MEG data and EG. Many of those, uh, the functionality of ME will appear soon on Brain Life, soon meaning within the next month. Thank you, Franco, very much for uh, this wonderful presentation. Uh, while we wait for other questions, I actually have uh, tons of questions myself uh, because uh, I am absolutely new to your project and I'm actually not part uh, of the neuroimaging community. I'm part of the musculoskeletal community. Uh, so um, I'm really thinking, you know, about uh, so many ways of how we can translate uh, these kind of uh, projects also for uh, our community. And uh, the first question I have is, uh, 
uh, when everybody, uh, when, uh, when uh, somebody uh, develops an app, um, do you provide the specific guidelines, not much on how to create the app itself, but like uh, the kind of language to use, if it has to be Python or any other one, if they have to have uh, to use the specific libraries, like, I would like to know how much freedom do you leave coders and how much guidelines do you provide them? Where is the, the balance there? Yeah, thanks. So the, we have an app specification that actually, so it's, it's this one, ABCD specs. The specification provides minimum information about what an app should have so that can be run from the platform. But at this point, uh, code can be any type of code as long as we have a way to test the code and run the code on our system. So we're running apps that are pure Python. We're running apps that are MATLAB, actually still MATLAB. What we do with app, with MATLAB, we compile the code sometimes. Um, and also with Python, we can do that or not. Uh, so what, the answer to your question is that really doesn't matter. You can see here the top type of languages, the top languages used is JavaScript, Docker, MATLAB, Python, and shell script. This is most of them. There's a couple of apps that are actually uh, R code. So let me see if I can see that. Yep, so this app, for example, is by Mandy Mejia, a collaborator on the platform. And it's a, it's a stop for the platform, but this is R code that we're running on the platform and it's also possible. But in, to answer your question, it doesn't really matter to us as long as uh, we can do it. And the way you define whether you can do it at that point, you, you probably Slack us or send us an email. I have this code. I would like to implement an app. Would you help, guys help me support the development on the app? I know I'm a newbie on this and I haven't done it and we can try to help you if we have the cycles. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, another uh, question uh, that uh, that I have, or actually, it's more of a comment. Uh, I found particularly interesting uh, where you showed uh, that the data and uh, uh, apps are are connected. Uh, where you actually, from uh, um, when you have a data set, uh, you um, you can see uh, which were the app that generated uh, that data set. Am I am I right? Um, right, and and so uh, just for me to understand better, the DOI that you provide is it related to the publications, or do you provide the DOIs also to datasets, uh, both uh, you know the very original one and the derived one? How do you manage DOIs and the uniqueness of uh, the, the data that you have? Great, that's a great question. So there's two types of DOI that I kind of glimpse over as I was presenting. One type of DOI is associated with the app. So that DOI, it's, it's uniquely associated with the current version of the app, okay? So you can put that DOI into your method section, say this is the app I use, and people can click on it and will be brought back onto the platform, okay? Now, there's another type of DOI, which is the DOI associated with the publication. So if you go to a publication, now there's a single DOI here that is associated to the full record. And in fact, the DOI is actually, I'm gonna change a different data set, more recent one, this one by Julia. Um, this DOI is actually a publication DOI. So you see the stem is different. This stem is a brain life pub publication, whereas the mm -hmm. stem on an app, the stem on an app is actually brain life dot app. So they're different yeah. DOIs, okay? Uh, but that's a good question. So this DOI points to the publication record that contains uh, the actual app with the version that were used for processing your data, right? Okay. Versus these other DOIs only point back to the current version. You know, this version might have changed uh, since yeah. you published something, whereas this version will not change. It's actually uh, tracked back down all the way to the git commit that you use for your version. Okay, but the data themselves do not have a DOI, am I correct? Each individual data set, no, only the okay. full record has a DOI. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Only, so this data set, for example, doesn't have a DOI, mm -hmm. but it's part of this record. Record, you mean publication? That's correct. 
Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, so from the chat, I see that, uh, uh, I'm, I don't know if I pronounce the name uh, correctly, I apologize in case I don't. Uh, Guillomar Niso uh, had a question um, that was related to his uh, talk that he gave before. And so if you wanted to intervene, feel free to do it. Um, I mm -hmm. think that somebody should allow you to talk uh, somehow. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you, Franco. Well, uh, I didn't know all the details of this such amazing platform, and I have received uh, a question before in my chat before uh, about a platform that maybe allows you to share some data with uh, your collaborations and not with everyone. And I didn't point to your to brain life, so I think Alexandra that asked before maybe. Uh, this is something you can consider because it's a really, really cool initiative. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Sorry, I, I intervened. Gumar, thank you very much. Exactly, this was a, my question, and this presentation was was really great. So thank you to Franco Pastilli. Basically, what I, I was asking if you can create a project and um, uh, share this project with other collaborators up upload the images from different, uh, you know, locations. But I, I think you, you showed yeah, this. So here you can create Alessandra. Exactly, starting. exactly. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. So one, one, one thing to point here is that we don't see Brain Life as a data uh, platform. Actually, we're trying to partner with Open Neuro as the data archive. Uh, and, and Brain Life contains data because data are necessary for your research. But the idea that we're trying to push over the next couple of years is to uh, use the archive that the Open Euro is for raw bits data, import it in Brain Life, do things, do your science, and then push it back onto Open Euro as much as the bits derivatives allowed. In, 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 what do I mean by that? I mean that because bits is a standard, it actually takes time to bring a community and agreement. So what we generate on the platform does covers way more data products than what is currently described by the BITS derivative. So there's need more work to be, but it's likely that BITS will lag behind a little bit more what people can simply come and flexibly develop on the platform. But the idea is that once the BITS is developed to a point that the data products are covered, um, then you can push back on Open Europe. So I, I've been using this metaphor here, uh, Open Euro and data archives are meant to be um, uh, data heaven, where you go there and you know everything is perfectly organized, standardized, and you know what you get. So in that sense, brain life is a little bit of a data purgatory, where you import your raw data from your scanner, you worked on it, you track reproducibly everything you do, and once the data is cleansed, then you can push it into heaven. Right, but and, and currently, I, I, I like to say that currently we are in hell, meaning uh, data are on many computers on different systems and they're all organized in different ways. And probably in the next years, uh, we will be required to do to change that either by the founders or by the journals or both or simply by the community. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks also to Gilmar. Okay, and now uh, Vittorio has another question. Um, hi, Franco. Thanks for this uh, amazing talk. Um, I would have, uh, very, it's more like a curiosity or a question. I don't know if I missed a passage uh, uh, in your talk. Um, so what about uh, this kind of distributed computing? Uh, um, could uh, someone, uh, for example, uh, an institution enter uh, this kind of like uh, collection of providers of hardware or uh, is this like, it, it, does this require like an agreement and an official staff paperwork and so on? Or it's something like that you could do uh, on the fly or maybe not on the fly, but with an you know, easy way, thanks. So technically, that's a good question. So technically, from, from our perspective, the easier the better. So we really just want to talk to you and your administrator and then you can come in and register a resource here. So you can create a new resource. And as long as you can do this basic, you know, sharing of keys and allowing inputs and output to some host that will allow to connect with your 
clusters. We've been supporting SLARM, clays-based cluster, condor-based clusters, and um, uh, PBS-based clusters. So the, the easy answer is that in a ideal world, you just do it. Then really it's your institutions, and you know, in our experience, most, most likely the institution will want some sort of agreement to happen. And we're happy to work on that, you know, and help you guys and help getting the resources. Uh, actually, that is a thing that we're trying to expand. We would love to have more resources, especially in Europe. Um, remember that resources here can uh, actually be associated with only specific apps. So you can envision, uh, for example, apps in CIMEC that come out of the CIMEC GitHub, right, that are only registered on the CIMEC resources, right? So you get all the rest of the apps available from BrainLive plus all the tracking, but you know that your data is stored on the CIMEC systems and it's processed on the CIMEC systems by simply you know, being a little bit smart of how you define your apps and how you make forks out of the apps that we already have and how you um, uh, deploy the apps on the resources that you have. These issues are which resources the data runs over. Obviously the project is completely open, it's completely distributed and that's allow us to uh, get to these big numbers. I actually have some statistics here. Uh, we processed over the, you know, this is 2020. From here to here, we process about uh, a million data sets. Uh, and then we, um, these are the many apps registered. We're over 300, actually over 350 at this point or close to 350 at this point. And then we have, we're handling about 150 terabytes of data at this point. And so, but you can have your own data storage. And this is the number of uh, projects that have been registered on the platform and the users and the task submits. We have about um, active user. We have about almost 500 active user and total register uses is about 1000 of this as of today. So, Vittorio, yeah, we really love to work with someone like you and some and a center like to develop in this direction. This is something that will really, really make an impact to the community. Uh, the idea is to have uh, availability of mechanisms for tracking and reproducibility at, available as services on the web. But then we definitely want to support individual institutions that might have their own requirement of where and how the data can store and process. So it was built into our philosophy that that should be able to happen. My question is that such a big project, right? So clearly a huge amount of effort and clearly a huge amount of work. Um, what are the next steps? Uh, what, uh, after establishing all this and uh, building all this and uh, beyond, I guess, like uh, Making, make it more and more scalable, right? So you will have new users, and so you will need more resources, like really in terms of uh, hardware, maybe, um, hardware and so on. But uh, uh, from a, a development perspective, uh, what comes next? You mentioned something before, if you can elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, so there's a couple of direction that we're working on. One, uh, interoperability. So we're trying to work with um, centers, imaging centers, departments, so that we can help um, connect the platform with actual more data. Uh, but really we are trying not to become a service support for different imaging center. We're trying to stay as a, as a platform, a free platform online. So that will require some efforts on the, plat on the side of the, of the centers. Uh, the other direction is to make it interoperable with other platforms. So we are, that's the open neural work. We actually in the process yeah. of writing a grant we're expanding the beats coverage. So that's another mm -hmm. effort that we're pushing this summer to get funding to actually cover more of beads within brain life so that uh, beads are in and out much quickly. As I said before, we like to think about getting beads data set in and out of the platform, but within the platform, we would like to keep um, the developers of the app and the people working on the data much more flexible. Uh, because we see these as a purgatory, not really as a, as a heaven. Finally, we have ideas of using machine learning and AI to uh, mm -hmm. help actually, we have a little bit of the processes here that suggest which apps to use, right? I showed that before. If you are in the middle of a project and you're trying to uh, analyze some data, for example, I can go here and you can um, 
push the data for processing. Here, I'm gonna stage the data for processing within this data set. Actually, I'm gonna find another data set. Um, and then, um, and this is an app test data set. Uh, you can push the data here. At this point, the platform suggests which type of apps can be run on that data set. So we have all the mechanisms to expand this with you know, machine yeah. learning. We're hoping that we will suggest better apps and we will improve the apps. Um, we're working on data ingestion. So how to get uh, data on the app on the platform now is very easy to do through the web interface. Uh, if you have a lot of data, you would probably need to use a, a command line interface, which is a little require more as a higher threshold of computing skills. Uh, we're trying to here cover people that don't necessarily have the highest computing skill, students, yeah. clinicians, and people in different domains that are interested in doing it right, but um, they don't wanna become computer scientists. Uh, so using machine learning will hopefully help ingesting the data, help suggesting the better way to analyze the data given the statistics on the platform, uh, which apps are used, which one fail, which one are very reliable, et cetera, et cetera. I have a question, but uh, before question, as a, let's say, brain life user, I would like to spend a few words as a testimonial. And uh, I would like to stress uh, uh, the fact that the brain life as a show in the home page, you have uh, data code and the computing. So maybe we may found uh, a different uh, solution for data because of there are open neuro, for example, we may have a solution for code like GitHub and so on, and also solution for computing. But uh, what makes really new for brain life is uh, have all these three component that is necessary for replicability and reproducibility of science all integrated together. I found that this feature really a winning factor and uh, to be honest, I took real advantage in my latest uh, publication to very easily uh, a way to provide DOI both for publication of data and the code. And uh, I believe that uh, this was a very great uh, added value of, on using uh, brain life. Anyway, uh, the question, the question is the following. Uh, Franco, what do you think uh, will be, let's say, the side effect on the community regarding, let's say, pipeline or uh, the analysis of, uh, of data? Because we heard in the past talk uh, this debate about, let's say, converge on uh, uh, standardized pipeline rather than diversity. So what do you believe will be the effect of brain life to push and enforce, let's say, diversity? Or do you believe that uh, a, brain, a platform like brain life will bring people to converge to, let's say, just the best practice or just one pipeline for, for data? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It, it's probably uh, going to be a little bit of a community discussion over the next years. I, I believe what we will see later with Oscar's presentation, there's a push for standardization of um, not just data formats and data standards, but also for computing. Uh, the, but then how is that standardization brought up? We normally, it's a lab, it's a single lab that develops something that is awesome and you know and that lab has the unique resources the unique position to develop what they're developing and that's right to be uh, the the philosophy in brain life is that we hope people by coming onto the platform and using maybe some code that is not perfectly standardized will find problems and issues this has happened for us many times now you know as part of a project uh, someone has developed an app and then someone else grabs the app very quickly after you should see how quickly if you develop an app on the platform someone else will start using the app and then return a problem you know show you that something that you have thought about actually doesn't work well and something that uh, you they wanted to fix so maybe works with one data set the one that you had available for testing but not on their data set so our philosophy is more that we are this intermediate you know more cloudy system where 
a more flexible and more flexibility is left to the developers so that good code will emerge and the good code is kept track of the platform by this type of statistics here that you see, you know, what, how many people are using this, how many people, uh, um, how many requests and how, what is the success rate of the app, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we will need to have a, we need to have a balance between the development of standardized, top-down development of standardized systems and then a bottom-up development of uh, processing pipelines that our community, uh, uh, community feedback is provided on and we provide mechanism for that. Um, I hope that answered the question, Paolo. Thank you for this uh, fascinating uh, presentation, this fascinating project. Um, if I got it correct, um, this platform is actually dedicated to the analysis, I mean, the whole processing. I would say the episodic memory of an experiment, but uh, so far, uh, if I got it correct, is related just to MRI, fMRI data, uh, MRI data. I was wondering if you are considering to implement this platform uh, to, uh, to have the possibility, the opportunity to integrate data from different methods. Uh, so integration between different type of approaches. All right, thanks for the question. So we are in the process of waiting for a grant that so seems to have been funded. We're in the last stages of the pipelines and the grant will actually expand and develop apps. Uh, this is in collaboration with Natalie George at uh, Sorbonne and Ina Pius and uh, Alexander Graham Fort, also and other folks in, uh, in the Sorbonne. We will add uh, many of the functionality of ME to process MEG and EEG data analysis over the next, it's a three year grant. Uh, it should be starting sometimes in the fall if everything goes well, and we will add all these. And that grant will work well with the other grant that we have with uh, Rick Batzel and Danny Bassett that is actually very laid down the pipeline which generates uh, statistics over matrices and networks of brain. And those networks can be built obviously with different data modalities. Um, and so can be built with EG and MEG, hopefully that will come soon. And currently we can cover fMRI and, um, and then a structural MRI. So yes, we're doing that. We're trying also to be sensitive about other projects that are appearing on the, on the landscape, for example, uh, Recently, relatively recently, um, uh, UCSD received a grant to develop NEMAR, a platform that will deploy EG uh, analysis uh, using Open Neuro. So we're looking forward to working with them so that we develop something that is uh, integrative and uh, you know, it doesn't replicate too much of the efforts. They're using a different toolbox base. We're, we're, we're pointing on Python and m and &E to do most of our uh, development for EG and MEG. We have a very last uh, quick question uh, by Vittorio. It's a very quick one. Uh, first of all, uh, I just want to, to, thanks, uh, to thank uh, Paolo Avesani because uh, it's uh, thanks to him that uh, I got to know uh, Franco Bastilli and this amazing project. And as far as uh, I was uh, uh, working with Paolo last year in, uh, in the team for the NARPS uh, initiative, I was just wondering whether we get like uh, uh, meta-analysis or meta-analytic results, quote, uh, let's say for free from uh, your platform. So if you can just extract uh, recurring results and so on. Uh, so something that uh, goes in the NARS direction uh, just by uh, construction in your platform, thanks. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Yes, we, we are envisioning that we are working toward building that capability, but uh, we're, we're developing the, the project, you know, ground up and grassroots. So what the project can do now is data pre-processing. The next thing we need to do once we extract features from raw data, say matrices, fMRI maps, or connectivity uh, structures or connectivity matrices, we want to be able to actually analyze those in the platform. So that's one active line of research. And, but remember, we are capturing 
um, many of the information that you will need to develop in the, precisely in the direction that you just mentioned, Vittorio. So yeah, in the future, we'll be able to, uh, we already can combine data sets across different sources to test how your project or results might hold changing the data set. That's already available through the data sets uh, portal here on Brain Life. And later we will do uh, what we can to provide back to the community information about uh, precisely. Actually, the Microsoft Investigator Fellowship, part of the support there that is bringing funding for computing to brain life, it, it's meant to develop in that direction that Vittorio asked about. So yes, we're definitely looking into that. We actually, uh, this is probably a good point. So my lab has moved and we are expanding where we have a lot of positions open and please reach out to us. And if you're interested in working on the project, you can either volunteer or, you know, visit us in Austin for a period um, or just uh, join the group. If you have the, the commitment, the interest and the skills to help with this project, we definitely are looking for engineers. We're looking for postdocs and I'll be taking students at UT Austin next year. That's fantastic. It really sounds like exciting times are coming up. So Franco, uh, thank you very much again for uh, this uh, uh, wonderful uh, presentation and for taking the time to answer to all our questions. Franco, thanks again. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks for sticking around.